Okay, good morning. My name is Gary Matsuoka, and this is Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And today's topic is one of our favorites. It's on avocado trees. Now, we are in California's avocado belt. It runs, uh, generally, it runs in the foothills from San Diego all the way through San Gabriel Valley up into Ventura County, all along the foothills. Uh, we're a little bit close to the ocean right here, so we don't warm up as well as the foothills behind us. So the foothills are just slightly better than here, but generally we do well here. So we should be able to grow avocados easily. The main problem we have in the trade is that the retail supplier of avocados generally does not produce a tree that lives. In most cases, it sits there, and that's all due to the soil. Oh, I forgot to move my soil sample up. But soil uh, that avocados would like to grow in is very sandy. And we all know what sand looks like in the trees that they sell us. Most of the re retail trees are in ground up wood or ground up bark, some kind of wood shavings. So they tend to rot. And then they say, well, avocados are shipped watering, which, well, they're from Guatemala, uh, the West Indies, and Mex in southern Mexico. And they, that's rainforest territory there. They like it wet. But when they're in a ground up wood or ground up bark product, that wood and the bark are rotting. And because of that, if you keep it constantly wet, that, uh, you know, when things decompose quickly, uh, it takes away the oxygen, gives off carbon dioxide. That's what decomposition does. And avocado trees have one of the highest needs, or maybe the highest need for oxygen of the roots of any tree. So if there's dead stuff in the ground mixed with them, they tend to rot very easily. Um, and for some reason, the nurseries haven't figured this out. I mean, we figured it out 30 years ago that, you know, that, you know back in the 50s when I was born, we just grew plants in sandy soil. And we never saw a root rot. In the 80s, they started adding ground up wood to it to make it lighter. And thinking that, you know, this dead plant material is part of the ecosystem that provides nutrition. Well, in nature, it's on top of it. That dead stuff is on top of it, not mixed with the dirt. You mix it with the dirt with the avocado roots, you lower the oxygen levels, it promotes root rot. And unless you let that thing get totally dry between irrigations, the air can get back in because the water itself is really low in oxygen, too. So you've got to get that water out of there so that the air can move back in. Now, if you don't have that dead stuff in the ground, they can sit in water for years and years and years. Um, and most people have done this. You take an avocado pit and put in a glass of water, and it grows in there and it lives. You know, we've seen trees this big in a glass of water. That's several years of growth and no drainage. So drainage is totally overrated. If that water has access to oxygen, just like a fish needs water that has access to oxygen, it can live in it. So, our, you know, these trees can be grown hydroponically, but if you've got compost in the ground, now, if the water sits around these trees, you know, if you have soil that doesn't drain, the water sits there for, say, two or three weeks without moving, then at that point, the roots may have used up all the oxygen. It's harder for water to circulate through soil than it is through a glass jar. So it, it, it's harder for the oxygen to get redistributed in the ground if the water doesn't move. But that that's you know that that takes a while for that to happen. So anyway, uh, avocados um, from Mexico, Guatemala, and the West Indies. The West Indies avocados are more tropical in culture, and they're usually grown in Florida or in the tropics. Why too? But they have a lower oil content. Now, for a while, they, you know, they're promoting them as slim coddles because, in theory, the more fat you have in the fruit, the more fat we get. But it turns out to be the opposite. Um, fats don't make you fat. If you eat fat, your body knows how. You know, you know what? What's what apparently happens is our body's real good at circulating fats. So you eat something fat, your body burns it right off. If you eat something sugary. It stores it as fat because it doesn't know what to do with it. The blood is not good at circulating sugar, so it just puts right away into fat. But if you eat fat, the body just burns it off. So avocados 
So the avocados on the East Coast are not that slimming as the West Coast avocados. So the avocados we grow are mostly Mexican and Guatemalan or hybrids of those two. Um, now today, this week we got in about 1,300 uh, trees of this size. So these were, were our seeds. This is a Zutano pit. So they use uh, the seeds of a tree called Zutano because it makes really big pits. It's not, the fruit's okay, but the skin on Zutano tends to crack and split easily. So it's not viable commercially. Uh, so they use the pits to grow a little seedling. So these pits were planted last spring, early summer, last spring, early summer. And then when they grew about this tall, they cut off the tops. And right where, where this blue tape is, they grafted a branch. This branch was about that long, it's about three inches from a mature tree onto the top of this seedling to get the variety you want. In this case, this is a gem. We're happy this year. The first year we can order these gems, uh, they, were, they came off of patent. So we can order them. So everything above this graph is going to be gem. Everything below this is a seedling of the Zutano. The disadvantage of seedlings, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, the, we sell them like this. We put them in pots, this five gallon bucket. We don't recommend you put these right in the ground because this is pretty small. I mean, uh, a squirrel or a rabbit comes by, they can chomp the whole thing a matter of minutes and it's gone. Or if you step on it at night, you won't see it, you've killed it. So we'd like to get them as big as a five gallon tree before you put them in the ground. And so we will show you how to put them in this five gallon bucket. And by July or August, they will be about this tall with stems about that thick. Um, now these trees here, these two, one year older than this. This is one of the biggest one, or tallest one, not the biggest, but one of the tallest ones. I mean, we sold, we grew about 230 or 40 of these last year. Uh, and most of them did fine. Um, this is kind of a medium height of what they look like after one year. And this, these are flower buds coming on. And this one you see loaded with flower buds, it's ready to bloom and, and produce fruit. So after one year after on this, they're ready to produce. Of course, it takes the flowers about a year to make fruit, but uh, you can have fruit in something this size within a year. Now, we like, we sell them this way only because I can't grow enough of these to, to you know, to serve everybody. I mean, we sell, last year we sold about, uh, oh, 900 of these this size to our customers. And we grew about 250 of them. That's that's all our growing grounds can hold. I mean, our property here is only half an acre. We just can't grow that many of them. So our customers have a chance to get a whole bunch of them, especially at this price. Um, especially because these are still perfect plants and soil that we recommend. Uh, once they get into bigger sizes, unfortunately, our grower doesn't put them in as as good a soil as we do. So uh, we. Because our stuff is just takes off and grows. I mean, this will put in a, you know, this one should go now into a 24 inch box. It's starting to get a little stressed in this size container. It's drying out too fast and during the warm weather. Uh, and in a box, it would fill out in about three to five months. And then, uh, but other nurseries that grow these, I was down at a nursery in Fallbrook last year and was listening to the guys, customer asked, Boy, there, how long it took to get from the 15 gallons to the box? He said two years. So, when they use that wood based mix, it takes a couple years. When you use the right soil, three to six months. So, that they, they should be growing. And we expect these to grow. Now, they do have growth spurts. So, this is about ready to start another growth spurt. There's some new growth right here. That'll be about a foot, foot and a half of growth. And they can do four growth spurts a year. So you can see how fast they're growing. Uh, this one had, you know, at least three good growth spurts last year. And last year was nice because it was one of the warmer summers we've had, warmer spring and summer. So they actually grew the year before that. They were a bit slower. Yeah. Okay, so um, story on avocados. The uh, the original 
commercial avocado in California was square tail. It's brought from seedlings brought from Mexico. They grew that one starting around 1910 because it survived a bad frost over a little over 100 years ago. There was a real bad frost. I don't recall what they said the temperature was. Uh, it must not have been as bad as the one that we had in 1990 because 1990 was the record. That was 23 degrees in this area, and uh, the Puerto survived that. So they, they call it Puerto port being strong, and they knew that one. But in the 1920s, Rudolph Hass, who lived in Whittier, um, planted some seedlings to graft, and one and this one seedling uh, wouldn't take the graft, and it grew and made fruit that is the Hass. Uh, so Rudolph Hass, uh, they called it Hass. Brokaw was their neighbor, so he had Brokaw uh, propagate these trees. So all these trees we have are from Brokaw Nursery, which was in Whittier. They're now in Ventura County, where the middle of the avocado growing area of California really is Ventura. Uh, so they produce these for us every year. They grow, oh, was it 300,000 avocados for orchards every year. They do grow you know, uh, a bunch more for other retail growers, plus us. So we order these from them. Um, they have a good supply of grafting wood and you know, professional grafters there. Okay, so I well, guess we had to plant this first. So we do like, we have a supply of brand new five gallon buckets. So you can use the used one, but you know, if there's a chance there's a root that that plant in there had root rot disease, this one can get infected and die. You can always clean out these by bleach, 10% bleach, rub it out, soak it in there. Uh, but a brand new one makes it easier. Now, our top pot potting scroll is what we use to grow these in. Uh, no wood product in, well, not much. I mean, the problem we always have is the uh, guys who blend this for us, their machinery, they don't clean it out. So some batches, you'll see a few wood pieces in there, not bad enough to hurt anything, but we try not to put any wood in here. It's uh, sand, volcanic rock, sponge rock, charcoal, which is inert, and uh, peat moss. And peat moss, even though it's organic and it does decompose, it is so old. So peat is a plant that died thousands of years ago up in a bog in Canada. And it's not really anything we have, so it doesn't really have a disease reaction. Plus, it's really old. They consider peat moss to be sterile. Uh, as it comes out of the bogs, because it's just, you know, it's just been sitting at the bottom of the lake for thousands of years. Um, we use peat moss because it does two things well. It really holds water, stores water well for plants. It's the best thing we have natural that stores water. Plus, it all also wicks the water sideways. So if this was a bucket full of sand and pumice, put water on top, it just will straight down and out. It won't stay around, whereas the peat moss helps it wick sideways. Um, clay does that very well too, but you put clay in a pot and it just stops draining. There's more than say 10% clay in here, it just stops draining. So we don't like to put too much in there. I mean, you can put a little bit of dirt from the ground in our potting soil, but not too much. You, you just have to keep the clay content really well. So anyway, when we're, now uh, this small bag is perfect amount to fill this pot. So we're gonna get one. This, our larger bag, one cubic foot, is enough to fill two and a half of these. So what we do, not only, put about uh, three inches of fill at the bottom of the pot. And check the height. A little low, maybe four inches. 
this soil will settle. So when we when we're filling the pot, we want the seed to be about the same level. The top of the seed, which should show a little above the ground, to be about the same level as the rim, because it's going to settle when you water. So then you set a box cutter, so it's just the blades barely out. You find a side where you don't see too many. You can kind of see the the roots running along the sides here. So you kind of find one side that doesn't have too many roots on it and slice slice it. If you cut a few roots, it's not a big deal. So I made the cut being as shallow as I can. And there's a lot of roots under there, but it doesn't appear I cut any. Then peel this off. Now these little sticks I usually live in, you can take them out. But this is the way they they tell us what variety it is. So the gems have this little yellow stick. Carmen's got a little blue stick. Greens have a little green stick. So they're color coded that way. A few of them, they write the names down. So peel that off. Now, this is the graft here. This is actually a sucker coming up that's been cut once. So just watch this. Uh, and it, just keep those from growing. So for a few years, you'll have to watch to make sure there's no suckers coming off this the original seedling uh, plant. So we'll set this in here. And just put the soil all around it. So there's soil underneath it, soil all around it. These scoopers are really nice when you're working in small areas. Uh, um, Martin Fine Art. Their uh, food section, uh, food <laughs> tools. Now this soil is somewhat damp, so I'm not going to worry about it. But normally, we like to get these watered within a few minutes of after you put it around the. But this time you're when we get the soil from our Packers up north, it's exposed to the elements, so it's kind of damp. You can tap it a bit, that helps uh, settle it a little bit. I can see I'm a little bit low on the soil. That's pretty good. And then now we stake our trees because we want them to grow straight and narrow because we have to fit them all in. Um, you don't have to do that. And look at Brokaw's Orchard. Most of our avocado trees go up about a foot and then they shoot off all directions. So it's not essential to stake one, but we like to do that because we like plants with a single trunk. Uh, just presents itself better when it's when they're all standing in lines. And then, uh, so we put a stake in there and tie it up. So that we get a, now if you have more than one branch, this one has several, don't cut them off. I mean, just let them grow. And if they're growing horizontally, they tend to fruit better. If they're going straight up, they tend not to fruit well. So it's nice to have a lot of horizontal branches on your tree anyway. That's about all I can tie at the moment. There's not much to tie. And then what we do for our own purpose, we put one scoop of this. This is about an ounce scooper. Uh, one scoop of Osmocote time release fertilizer. And one scoop of uh, one of the Dock Earth fertilizers. Mo almost every single one of the fertilizers has the same bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi that inoculate this. In the ground, this is not essential because the ground's got everything of this. Nature lives in the ground. In our potting soil, there's no nature yet. So in order to help the roots develop better. Now, I don't know if Brokaw already does inoculate seeds with the mycorrhizal fungus. I, most of the 
nurseries that know about it do. I don't know if they do, so we just do it. I haven't really asked them. Should ask the guys. We put a about a scoop of the doctor earth in there. Now, generally, they'll try to mix it in a little bit. It should be near the surface, so all the fertilizers work better near the surface if they're not buried. We always put it on the top, then water, because if I bury it, I just can't remember if I did it or not. <laughs> you, know, you do 10 of these in a row and you go, wait, did I put fertilizer on that? You know, you just don't. Then you have to dig around, always leave it on top and, and assume it's there when you water, and then it kind of mixes in with the dirt at that point. Now, these are still kind of sensitive to heat and cold. Now, fortunately, we haven't had too much either way. Uh, you get above 80 degrees, because these are coming out of the greenhouse, these leaves will scorch a little bit, but it's not, they, we never see them burn severely unless it gets around 100. So they'll scorch a little or get sunburned a little bit, but uh, you know, so for the first week or so, if you want to put them in half of this sun, that's fine. In the morning, it's going to have to shade. Uh, we have to watch the temperature right now. We got them a month earlier than we did last year, which can be a problem because there's a chance of frost all the way into mid-March. And this winter is running cold. So, um, you know, two days this week, we threw blankets over the tops of those, which keeps, you know, traps the heat from below, keep from above freezing. Unfortunately, I found out in the morning, my cats were laying all over the blankets. <laughs> so, so uh, they broke a few tops off. But anyway, we'll watch the temperature. And, and, and if, if it gets, they say it's going to drop below 45 at night, then you might just bring these underneath the eaves of your house or underneath the patio cover or something like that on your porch. Anytime there's an overhead structure above it, it, it traps the heat better than being out exposed. Uh, within two weeks, uh, it's, it's pretty good against the sun, but do watch the cold until, um, until mid-March and then get them in full sun, water them, keep them wet. You can't overwater anything in here. There's nothing here that, you know, this peat moss, perlite, pumice, sand, charcoal, nothing of that can promote rot. So you can keep these real wet. It may only take, you know, one watering a week if it's in the 60s, two waterings a week in the 70s. Uh, once we get into the 80s, we pretty much water every day. And uh, now they grow in spurts. So they'll sit around for a while at this size and then just take off to about here. And they'll sit around for a few months and take off and get to there. And by if you do that second growth spurt after that one's done, this should be big enough to put in the ground or into a bigger pot if you like. So these were potted up in both in August of last year. So they were, we had them, we planted them April, May, June, July, August. So four months in the pot and they were big enough to move. This is uh, still February. So these might be ready in July. Okay, so that's, but once you find a spot in the ground, um, again, drainage is overrated. It's because our plants are, are fine. So get them in a, you know, you don't want a spot, like I had a spot in my last house that after a good rainy season, there'd be a pond there for three months. That's not a place to plant them. But we did plant ours right next to that area. What we did is brought in, uh, so what we did for that is we brought in two truck pickup loads of dirt, sandy dirt, sandy loam. Uh, and, and just made a hill there. Essentially, it was the same height as the root balls of the plants of our avocado. We put the avocado above ground, essentially. Surrounded with this sandy dirt, put drippers and micro sprinklers on here to water. If you don't have a dripper or micro, you put a little basin around that to hold it. Uh, University, well, <laughs> Brokaw recommends three foot wide mound. They like to, you know, since for them, Root rot is the main problem that avocado growers face. Uh, University of California recommends that the farms berm this thing two foot off, off two foot high berms, which is like this, and plant avocado trees in that. I mean, that's going to get your trees way up there. Um, so they're so concerned about root rot. I'm not that concerned. You get the right a plant, and without the compost around it, it shouldn't rot that easily. I mean. 50 years ago, we didn't do stuff like this. We, we only had to do that since um, the universities have told them when to plant plants in compost. So, um, I mean, someday they'll figure it out. 
Yeah. But anyway, um, so if you get them with good drainage, now in my last house, my whole backyard was clay. We actually set one in the ground and it did fine. We didn't have any problem with that to a soil level, but this area wasn't collecting the water like that area was. <laughs> um, Brokaw recommends, well, they used to recommend one gallon a day. Now they're backing off because I think they're having root rot problems because the trees they're producing for the orchards have a little more compost than they used to. But we still like to say one gallon a day, first summer, uh, four gallons a day the second summer, and so on and so on, 16 gallons a day. But, I mean, they say a full-size avocado tree in Riverside would use uh, 50 gallons water a day. Now, we don't plan to grow them that big. I would say if you grow a tree, and most of these are the varieties we sell are, are um, practically wood. So if you grow a tree about eight by eight around here in the middle of summer, you might need uh, 15 gallons a day, something like that. So avocados, apparently, if they're not producing, they're growing. So if you have a tree that's loaded, it'll put all the energy into the fruit. If you have a tree that doesn't have any fruit on there, they can grow just as fast as they grow for us, which is three to four feet in one year. So every year they'll go three to four feet taller if they're not producing, and then eventually they'll be over 20 foot tall. Um, most of the varieties we sell do not take a year off. And there are a few on there that do take years off, and then they'll grow that year. Of course, uh, that's not that bad. If you grow three foot in one year, you can just clip it off. The hor Again, the horizontal branches produce fruit. The ones at the top of the tree don't really produce that much. So. Um, it turns out, too, that uh, all the orchard research has shown that trees that are only about five foot wide, the whole tree remains productive because the sunlight can get to the center. If you've got a tree that's 15 foot wide, like in the old days, um, this area in the middle, the 10 foot area in the middle is so, so dark that you just can't get any fruit production in there. It's kind of a waste of space. So if you keep your trees trimmed to maybe just a little bigger than this, say this wide, that tall, you'll get more production per square foot in your yard than you will if you let it get bigger. You'll have more fruit on a bigger tree, but not per square foot. So in that case, you put three or four of these trees in where you, in the old days, you only put one, and you'll get more food off of three or four small trees than you will off of one big tree. Plus, you can also have different ripening periods, which is great. Yes. If you had, uh, let's say you had three trees in your plant, and then how far apart would you put them? Well, you want them to grow, say, stay, they say the absolute best size is five foot wide, but I don't know, five foot wide is a little narrow for an avocado. I might go six foot, and maybe that would be seven, eight foot between trunks. How does that work for like a holiday or is it like more of a spreading type avocado? You always have to trim them that way too. Now, there's a different way to. So right now, the main project at the Irvine Field Station, where they do all the avocado research, University of Riverside's field station in Irvine, right off of Irvine Boulevard, they're espaling all the avocados. Uh, they do that in Japan. They've always done that way in Japan because they have to grow them in Quonset Hut greenhouses. Uh, they just use two branches on each tree there, just grow them sideways. Um, in South Africa, they've been putting them on wires now for at least a decade, and they said they'd have very positive results. Now, we're finding out why that's true. Uh, at the Great Park in Irvine, we planted a, an avocado tree there 20 years ago. No, 15 years ago. And eight years ago, my wife and I were there. We were just wanting to see how much fruit was on it. And on this tree uh, that was in this raised planter, so a great planter, there was a branch that was just hovering about a foot off the ground. And it that one branch, we counted 50 fruit. There was more fruit on that one branch than it was on the rest of the tree. It was just what was going on is the fruit were hanging like this and they were touching the dirt. So this branch was stuck in a horizontal. Whereas you grow a branch here with fruit on it, that branch is pulled straight down by the way of the fruit. And when it's pulled straight down, it no longer gets any sun, enough sunlight to make another crop. So the tree has to grow another branch out here 
a year later, and then that fruits, and then it hangs straight down. So they keep doing that. They keep dropping down. Uh, and those branches never fruit again. Whereas this branch here can't go any place. It's in full sun. It just keeps fruiting. I mean, we couldn't. We just couldn't believe it. But later that year, I was at a customer's house. They had a house tree. Same thing. A branch going right across their um, flagstone, loaded with fruit. And so I've seen that. So now we know why a spelling works. I mean, right now, this year, they're running the research to see which trees a spelly are the best. So you grow, you know, like they do apples that way a lot too now because of the size of the fruit. They're just running them along the fence <laughs> and grow them like that. I mean, there's certainly some avocados that are monsters that you can't do that way, but uh, a lot of the avocados, like Holiday, is almost a vine. That might work real well as a star, but they're they're checking out right now. Okay, so the way to trim, pretty much that those ways. Um, what you have to watch out for. Well, this is an avocado that's just under drought stress. So last year, you know, we had a, we we're supposed to cut back our watering twenty percent. So this. So you can tell it's not root rot. So root rot, you can get leaves that do this tip burning too, but the leaves are usually very small and just at the ends of the branches because they can't they can't pull up any fertilizer, they can't pull up enough water. So they're trans so the leaves are getting real small. They're transferring the nutrients to the new growth, so all the old leaves drop off. So that's the root rot. Um, this is just dry. So here is cute dryness where you see the browning along the vein. That's where it got all of a sudden dry and probably in one of the Santa Ana winds this fall. Uh, this on the edge is this chronic drying where uh, the tree is pulling up the last water from the dirt, the last water from the ground it has all the salt dissolved in it. They all the salt build up on the edge of the leaves. They say avocados, you know, that we don't, since we don't get that much rain in Southern California anyway, this, at least this much is what is normal in an avocado orchard this time of year. Because you know if they if they watered enough you wouldn't see this but they just can't use that much water it's just too expensive for the water so you know 20 percent burn on the leaf is not critical uh, they'll put up with that and then when the new set of leaves comes on so when they bloom there's a new set of leaves that comes on right after that most of these will fall off and then your tree will look totally normal again normal and green like this one. So this one, you can see the oldest leaves at the bottom. Some of these leaves actually may be two years old now. No, over a year old. This tree is very young, but, um, but yeah, they can hang on for the leaves for several years if there's not too much salt to them, but it's not fair. Well, we have uh, an avocado in the ground, and that's why I would say, say that. And I'm always worried about the root rot. But if it looks like that, I need to water it more. Right. So the way to check water, uh, so avocados have shallow roots, but they like the whole root system to be moist. And one way you can tell that is you have, you have a stake like this or a piece of rebar about that same size. If you can push it in the ground about a foot where you're irrigating your tree, that's adequate. I mean, it's nice to go a little deeper than that, but if you can push it through that sole a foot deep, like, you know, like modeling clay, wet modeling clay, you push anything through it. Mm -hmm. If it's dry, you can't push anything through it. And that's the same with the ground. No matter if it's sand, soil, clay, if there's rocks, that's a different problem. Or if you hit a root. But generally with, with soil, if it's wet enough for the plants to get the water out of it, you can push a stick through it. You want to see at least 12 inches underneath your avocado tree where you water it. to be able to push it down 12 inches. So if you put a grip line around, how far from the front should the First line and then it's out for second line. The second question on that is kind of related to it. Is it better to keep water less frequently or more shallow water and more frequently? Well, all the research has shown that more shallow watering more frequently is more efficient than deep watering. Because you know, when you in the old days, they would water an orchard by flooding it every seven days. So it was too wet for two days, too dry for two days, and nice for three days. That's the problem with with that flood irrigation. Whereas if you watered 
lightly every day. You try to keep the moisture level high, but even. They don't want it to run dry anymore. They said running dry is really bad for production. So they just want to keep it wet, but not wastewater. So, you know, again, water is not the enemy here. Uh, drought is more the enemy. If you adequately water, you're fine. You're not going to drown the tree if you keep it moist. So most orchards water daily. Most orchards that have avocados use micro sprinklers that shoot the water over at least 56% of the underneath the drip line area. They like to get more area cover than drippers do, but if you have drippers, just yeah, run a ring close to the trunk, try to do it every few feet so that you get more of the ground covered. I mean, I run off cows with very little water, with just two drippers on them, and they still stay alive and look good, but I think they do better if you can water more of the eggs. And um, also, you know, they like a deep layer of dead leaves underneath them. They like their own dead leaves. Uh, 40 years ago, the avocado growers thought they would promote root rot, so they cleared them all off, and they found out that the decomposing leaves actually uh, produced chemicals that prevented root rot. So the so the research said, put them all back, put the whole leaves back there. You have a pile on this side? Yeah. That's, I mean, it's natural for them, so. This leaf underneath the tree. I'm just wondering, so these you said to water every day, one gallon a day? No. When they're big enough to put in the ground, that's, so when they're about four foot tall, that's about how much water they'll need. But, yeah. Right. Um, at this size, you know, a couple cups a day. And this weather, you know, when it's below 70, plants hardly use any water at all. You get above 75 to start using a lot of water. So it's not critical right now, but keep them looking moist. Keep them looking moist. Just air on the side of wetness. On the other scale, um, temperature wise, three years ago, we had that really bad group that got to like 115. And I had a quarter of them just, you know, it, it almost turned black. Right. So what do you do? Can't do anything. So when we had a crop growing, you know, we had about 70 trees growing in these pots. It was July that year, and they had about this much new growth. It just turned black. Couldn't do anything about it. the mature leaves down below. No problem. They didn't have any problem with that heat at all. But the new growth that just came out, it just it just shriveled up. I mean, my daughter was out there watering it. All day long, she said, this is still turning black. I can't do anything. Nothing works. And nothing can. If it's 115 and that new growth just can't handle it. Uh, so, but, you know, the rest of that summer was around 100 degrees. They liked 100 degrees, apparently. I mean, Guatemala must be close to that temperature because they grew back really quick. That year we had some real good growth in our avocado trees. The next year was terrible. It was too cool. <laughs> they like the heat better than they like it cold. But 100, anything above 110 can, can really mess up that new growth. Do you bring the dead growth or how do you? It just shriveled and fell off. <laughs> we didn't have to do anything. I mean, there are certain larger branches that. Oh, yeah, sun burning. So this plant was around at that time. I mean, this was an event. My daughter had planted some trees and grafted them, but she didn't remember what this was. She just left in her backyard and abandoned it. So this one got severely sunburned. All the tops of these branches turned brown didn't kill them, but it turned brown. I mean, again, this is in our soil, so they're healthier than most trees. We noticed that from other growers, they'll sunburn the tops of the branches, exposed sun will sunburn at 95. From Brokaw, 110. So, uh, so the healthier trees tend to be able to handle the heat. I guess they're, you know, cooling off by good circulation. Uh, but if the Tree's not healthy, then they sunburn at a much cooler temperature. But so this one made it through that. Uh, this hasn't been fertilized for like three years, so it's really pale. So I brought to work and said, well, because we we didn't think it was grafted, but then this year, last year it bloomed and we set some fruit. We're going, okay, it must be grafted. So I found the graft on it and said, okay, it must be something good if my daughter grafted it. So we're we're gonna um, we fertilized it and the new growth should come out green again. We'll see what kind of fruit it makes. What happened? What happened to that one? Like, um, did that lack of vitamin or something? Yeah, just no fertilizer for three years in that pot. So, 
So the leaves get smaller because of that too. And then the veins are real pale. So that's just a lack of fertilizer. Uh, but it's not a rot or anything because it's in our soil. I still watered it for her every day, but no one was taking care of it. She got ready to move away. So she's just sitting in our yard for a few weeks. How, how often should we fertilize them in there? Well, okay, so the often quote we're using, this is the six month time release. And if you're just using organics, you got to fertilize every month. I mean, when I was a kid, my dad told me fertilize, you know, water every day, fertilize once a month, your plants have been good. Um, but that's so much work for us. We do this once for six months. We expect this to be sold or put in a bigger pot or put in the ground by six months. So you only have to do this once, which is why we do it. So we don't have to go out there. I mean, in the old days, we had to have employees every month, you know, go around the nursery fertilizing everything. And what's them in the ground? Well, okay. So when you first grow an avocado, you want to just keep it well fertilized. Just keep fertilizing, you know, you can fertilize every season or, or you know, this one every two seasons, just to get it up to size. Once it's a good, say eight foot, five, six foot across, you can almost turn off the fertilizer because they don't need the fertilizer to fruit. In fact, avocados is one plant that they say starving when it's blooming is if it's you know, at this stage, if you feed it, um, they'll start making leaves right away and may abort their fruit to make the leaves. So they say starve it. They say uh, in a mature tree, if you're going to fertilize a mature tree, fertilize well before the bloom or well after, but don't fertilize while they're setting fruit. So those months on an avocado tree be November, 